I'm presenting our paper called Accessibility in the Crowded Sidewalk, Micromobility and Its Impact on Public Space. I'm Cynthia Bennett, and my co-authors included Emily Ackerman, Bonnie Fan, Jeffrey Bigham, Patrick Carrington, and Sarah Fox, and we're from Carnegie Mellon University and the University of Pittsburgh. One of our interviewees, Jane, a transportation consultant, pointed out that streets and sidewalks have been turned into a marketplace, even though they are our largest public asset. As disabled people intermingle in publics, urban accessibility is socio-political. In this talk, I'll position micromobility, one of the types of transportation exploding onto our streets and sidewalks, to argue that designers and researchers have a role to play in tech policy and tech integration into public spaces. So what is micromobility? Micromobility encompasses a wide range of shared, small-scale transportation technologies used to aid in moving people and their belongings. Generally, these devices weigh up to 500 kilograms and are set to travel at low to moderate speeds, and they are powered by a combination of electricity and human force. Often, micromobility is networked and trackable, and users rent this transportation using smartphone apps. Recently, micromobility has taken U.S. cities by storm. Public officials have invited partnerships with micromobility companies. For example, Richmond Mayor LeVar Stoney called networked e-scooters a fantastic addition as he rode one through a product launch ceremony in 2019. Public messaging about this emergent form of transportation purports that it increases eco-friendly, low-cost movement that takes up less space than cars. But micromobility's impact is more nuanced. Media reports show vandalized and broken vehicles as protests by citizens. Additionally, micromobility has blocked sidewalks and crosswalks, and this particularly impedes movement by people with disabilities, who often also cannot ride these vehicles as they are inaccessible to operate. Laws and products have long communicated that disabled people shouldn't be in public. In the U.S., this philosophy was formalized with ugly laws enacted during the Reconstruction Era, which criminalized public displays of disability. Punishments were disproportionately levied onto Black and Indigenous disabled people, and many of these laws were not undone until the 1970s. At this point, disabled activists were protesting in full force, like those blocking traffic in this image, for legal rights to access public space and transportation. However, even with the Americans with Disabilities Act, contemporary innovations like micromobility can reintroduce access barriers into public space. Further, the commercialization of previously public utilities like abandoned Alphabet Smart City Initiative in Toronto is critiqued for increasing surveillance and not meeting public needs. And academic labs often fuel centers of R&D, propelling prototypes into public space. So we interviewed people with a variety of relationships to micromobility. They included people with disabilities who have been blocked by micromobility, public space activists, government and commercial micromobility workers, and operators who repair and rebalance micromobility to meet demand. We also analyzed archival and media traces and considered observations of disabled co-authors who have been blocked by micromobility. Now I'll overview some findings. First, cities received micromobility enthusiastically. An early adopter, Seattle, became reputable for setting an example of how to run micromobility in other cities. Adam, a municipal worker, recounted, A lot of the concepts about how to manage dockless micromobility originated in Seattle. To Adam and others, this reputation made up for some early accessibility mishaps. A different city, Pittsburgh, is still waiting on Pennsylvania state-level approval for e-scooters to launch as of now, but the city has been preparing to welcome micromobility partners. As such, they have convened a mobility collective made up mostly of transportation company representatives. Additionally, Pennsylvania passed a law that personal delivery devices like these robots have the same rights as pedestrians. In 2019, our co-author Emily Ackerman encountered one of these in a curb cut. She'll share more. One day, I waited to cross a busy intersection behind a lot of people. From my vantage point, I couldn't see what was across the street, but as I began to cross, I realized the delivery robot was sitting in the curb cut on the other side. No one was supervising the device, but I thought, it'll move by the time I get there. When I got there, the robot was still directly in the curb cut. I ended up bumping up a part of the curb that slopes up, which is dangerous for me because I could get stuck easily 
and also it's painful to have such a sharp jolt to my body. So I tagged Starship, the robot manufacturer, and the University of Pittsburgh where they were deployed in the tweet. The vehicles were immediately removed, but the gesture was short-lived. Robots from the same company were deployed again four days later and continued until the COVID-19 pandemic. During those four days that they were off sidewalks, I communicated with the manufacturer, who initially apologized for the bug, but the next day issued a retraction and said they were happy to see that I got around it. The retraction caused a lot of backlash at me for whining. I was raising a very dangerous issue, and the internet turned into this very scary place of, well, you didn't get hit by a car, right? I felt in danger and not safe to walk around my own campus. As Emily mentioned, pilot programs for unsupervised delivery devices continue. One micromobility operator, Carl, told us that scooter chargers like him were disincentivized from reporting broken vehicles as they would not get paid for charging them. I was supposed to mark scooters for repair and let somebody else pick them up. But after I've walked half an hour to pick up a scooter, if I could charge it, I could get paid for it. So I put scooters back out with no brakes. Carl himself sustained an injury from riding micromobility that required emergency medical attention. Local governments and companies have responded to accessibility concerns. For example, companies have published training videos and cities now fine for improperly parked micromobility. Seattle began auditing micromobility to enforce parking regulations adopted after the unregulated pilot program, and cities have sponsored programs that offer recreational cycling with accessible bikes. But these provisions were reactionary and sometimes temporary. Michelle, a disabled biker who cannot ride traditional micromobility vehicles, articulated a common call for early prioritization of people with disabilities. So one of the things that government administrators should be insisting upon is a certain percentage of and a variety of adaptive bikes in the bike share program, and that the ability to use these is no more onerous than it is for an able-bodied people to check out standard bike share. Offering training and conducting audits placed responsibility on citizens to do the right thing and recreational programs did not meet disabled people's public transportation needs. Now I'll overview some takeaways for design researchers. Accessibility is not a specialization, but our designs always impact disabled people. They may wish to be end users, but they may also be non-users like Emily, who just wanted to coexist with this robot. In the worst cases, as we found with curb cuts, Long fought for access provisions that enabled disabled people like Emily to safely cross the streets make possible movement by emergent technologies such as this unsupervised robot. Access provisions need continued protection from unjust use. Next, pilots in public space impact people. They cannot be treated as see what happens experiments. Designers may proactively regulate for safety, access, and equitable distribution. Next, refusal to adopt our technologies and activism like Emily's social media is a legitimate form of design communication, offering inroads for us to strengthen partnerships and opportunities to design or withhold responsively. Finally, open data can be empowering such as when used by people with disabilities to plan accessible routes. But when companies, for example, appropriate such information to plan test routes for robots which also need curb cuts, the open data becomes exploitative. Open data should be released with caution, with standards of use, and expectations for users who intend to innovate with it. Fuser research should concern a methods for equitably distributing data resources to those who most need it. Thanks for watching. You can find me on Twitter at CLB5590 and download our paper from tinyurl.com slash micromobilityA11Y.